Austrian economics. Turn off the air conditioner, which I forgot to do before I sat down. Here we go. Um, okay, our third school of thought. Uh, let's see, chronologically, actually we've gone pretty much in order. Uh, the, um, eh, the Austrians and the Marxists are going to be about the same time, actually. It, it, it's very similar. Uh, and the creator of Austrian economics, not that that's what he set out to do, was Karl Menger. He was from Austria, hence the name. And my recollection is, it outlines at the beginning of the book, my recollection is that he was, uh, he was setting out to argue with something in the German historical school. And he was trying to be very polite and, and respectful about it, but uh, they didn't take it that way. Uh, and so they made fun of him anyway. And they, as an insult, called what he was putting forward Austrian economics. Right? So that was an insult originally. These Germans, again, said Austrian crap. Well, the Austrians are like, Oh yeah? We're going to call ourselves that. We're going to disarm you and make that no longer an insult by accepting that name ourselves. So that's where the name, the name comes from. And I'm going to give you four, 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 yeah. You'll see all this in the chapter, uh, but four major sort of characteristics of Austrian economics, right? Uh, and I'll, I'll list them out here and then I'll talk about them. Method all Aj Ikal Individualism Praxeology Third Markets as creators of and fourth, process. Okay. Uh, something that is unique about Austrian economics is their heavy emphasis on philosophy and on methodology. And methodology is talking about uh, not, not the research we do, but how do we go about research? What is a reasonable way to create knowledge. What is knowledge, right? And we don't really talk about that a lot in some schools of thought. Uh, for example, the neoclassical, we don't really spend a lot of time on that. The Austrians consider that a really important first step. Hey, before we go jumping in here and trying to explain what's going on in the world, what is it that we think we can explain? And uh, how is it that we should be able to, how we should explain things and so forth? And so think about that as I go through this, because you'll, 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 uh, I think you'll see that here as I go through these four items. Um, crap, I was going to tell you something else. Something else occurred to me right then. Uh, if it's important, I'll remember it. All right. Okay. So the first one is, and, and maybe I will toss this in right now. Generally speaking, they sort of lean towards the neoclassical view of markets are, are uh, advantageous, perhaps the best you know, uh, social tool we've ever come up with, um, but for different reasons, interestingly enough, for different reasons. So. Here's what they're going to say. First of all, Austrians place heavy emphasis on the idea that social developments are simply the aggregation of individual ones, that societies don't do things, people do things. So their focal point is going to be the individual, all right? So individual preferences, uh, individual actions, individual, you know, one of the things they talk about is how can I know whether or not something is consumption or investment. Remember from an earlier video I talked about for TCU, these are investment goods. Uh, well, we can only tell that through the intent of the individual buying them. What if I run a home business? If I buy these, is this consumption or investment for me? Only I know. And uh, if I'm going to use it for my home business, it's an investment. If I'm going to use it to uh, play, you know, Pictionary, uh, I don't know if you even know what that game is, uh, then, you know, no, it was, it was consumption expenditure. So he said, you know, th that, that all of these things reside in the mind of the individual. Uh, and that this is going to be stark contrast when we reach the institutionalists who say actually the social part is what drives the individual. They're saying, no, 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 the individuals are making the choices uh, and the individual should be free to do so. Second one, ooh, this is interesting. The science of human action. It is based on the belief that economic behavior is governed by laws that are logically derived from basic principles of human action 
beginning with the idea that every conscious action is intended to prove, improve a person's satisfaction. Okay, so here's what they're saying there. That, and let me read, read this part right here. Economic behavior is governed by laws that are logically derived from basic principles of human action. So, we put in here basic principles of human action for our premises, and then we conclude with uh, economic laws of behavior. So, we've got, let me read it again. Economic behavior is governed by laws that are de logically derived from principles of human action, beginning with the idea that every conscious action is intended. Did I make it with intended? I did. Intended to improve a person's satisfaction. And they consider that to be just like I think therefore I am a axiomatic it's an obvious truth that even trying to reject it actually causes you to accept it. That, well, I don't think that's true. Uh, why are you saying that? Uh, you're saying that because you're trying to improve your satisfaction. Uh, you're arguing with me because you're trying to improve your satisfaction. That obviously every action is intended to improve your satisfaction. So that's their first core thought about the way human behavior works. All right, this is, again, a basic principle of human action. And when we think these things through, we can come up with various theories, which we will do here in probably the next video. I probably won't squeeze it onto this one because it takes a while. But I want to tell you the Austrian argument of what causes the business cycle. And it's going to be based on the individual preferences of the people we're modeling. All right. So let's see. I, I, I want to add there. Do I want to do it there? Um... Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. Uh, there are, there, there, I should say there is, a minority of Austrians who believe, and I can't remember if they're the ones associated with, uh, um, with uh, oh gosh, what are his two followers? Uh, Mises or um, uh, the other joker, Hayek. Uh, but one of the two of them was split off in this direction. Uh, there are some Austrians who believe that we can come up with these premises that are unassailable, in part because we already are homo sapiens. It's not like we're biologists trying to study frogs. We're homo sapiens studying homo sapiens. Uh, so the statements we make about human behavior are at least more likely to be reasonable. But they're arguing that we can come up with, with um, uh, what I want to say there. I want to come up with a conclusion that our conclusion isn't a theory, it's the truth, it's the way it is. So I'll just say unassailable. We can come up with premises here that are absolutely, unquestionably correct. Not just warranted, but correct. And, so if we have assumptions that are absolutely unassailable, and we're careful about the validity of our argument, then we're not just coming up with a theory down here. This is the truth. This is the way the world works. And it's interesting. Um, my friends who are Austrians, uh, I, I actually learned this from one of them. Some of the Austrians I'd known were real jerks, all right? And most of them were quite pleasant. Uh, the, 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 the two people that, that helped me with this chapter, Sam Bostaff and, and, and Doug Butler, uh, were extremely kind. And I've known them for years. Uh, and, and so the, Sam Bostaff was the department chair at University of Dallas. That was my first ever job interview. Very nice man. Um, and David Prochitko, a Facebook friend, really nice man. Uh, also uh, leans towards Austrian economics. Um, oh, uh, uh, Stephen Horowitz, another really nice man. But it was one of those people who told me, yeah, we've got some real jerks, too. He says, and those are the ones who lean this way. Because to them, if you disagree with them, because they believe they're giving you the truth, if you disagree with them, then either you're stupid 
or you know I'm right and you're pretending otherwise and so therefore you have an ulterior motive. Either way, there's really not much point in talking to you about economics. Uh, we can talk about the Rangers if you want to, but we can't talk about economics. And I had met people like that, and I wondered why they were like that. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I, I didn't go back and check to see if this is the way they lean. But I was like, okay, that makes sense. Uh, that there are uh, a minority of Austrians who lean towards this idea, and it, this is covered in the, in the book too, uh, that what they're coming up with are unassailable premises that then lead to the truth. Most of them, uh, the, the vast majority, as I say, are like, yeah, I think this makes sense. I think this makes sense. I think this makes sense. But I don't know if I'm coming up with the truth. But that all falls under the praxeology uh, heading. So that's why I mentioned that there. All right. Uh, this next one here, uh, this is one of the places where they really have a unique view on the market system. The typical neoclassical approach to explaining, say, where do people go to buy gas, all right? involves modeling the individuals in question with complete information. They know where all the gas stations are, they know where all the prices are, they know, you know, uh, whether their car needs, uh, you know, a premium or, uh, uh, you know, the, the regular or whatever. Um, and then they sort of do a couple of equations and, aha, they would pick this gas station. The Austrians are like, we never have that much information. That, that's a terrible way of explaining how the market system works. That in fact, the real world, I'm going to use a different color I haven't used here. Uh, the real world is uncertain, which by the way, the next school of thought we're going to do makes a big deal out of this too. It's very interesting. It's why I put these two together is that they have, that they, they share some similarities in their premises, but then come to different conclusions, the Austrians and the post-Keynesians. But at any rate, going back to this, we never have that kind of information. And anyway, that's not why the market's great. The reason the market's great is because it creates signals for us that then allow us to collect information and to make rational choices. Uh, for example, uh, I haven't used black. Ah, big orange. How about them balls? Prices, profits, interest rates, all of those emerge from market actions. All of those emerge from consumers and suppliers interacting and creating these numbers here that I can now look at and see, aha, uh, th this is where I should go to buy gas. Uh, and so the real glory of the market is that, let me read my answer here. Austrians see market participants as inevitably handicapped by a lack of knowledge. Markets create knowledge for these stumbling, bumbling individuals by providing rules and signals. We're trying our best, all right? Uh, we're trying our best to figure out, I think especially of the entrepreneur in, in this particular um, framework, that I'm thinking I want to start a business. wonder what I should start. Gosh, I have nowhere to look. Oh yeah, I can look at profit figures and figure out what are people buying and selling, all right? What, what, what's, what's very popular right now? I can look at prices. I can think about uh, interest rates in terms of financing my, my uh, company. But none of these, here, here's a really important Austrian point, none of these exist outside of the market system, all right? Those don't exist outside of the market. Therefore, what the market truly does that is, that is so useful is not from a neoclassical perspective where we already have all the information, it is that it creates the information that we need to make choices. Uh, and I find that a very unique and interesting aspect of, of, of this particular school of thought. Um, and again, interestingly, they largely agree with the neoclassicals in many, not, not all certainly, but in, in many policy areas, but for different reasons. They're like, hey, hey, you're missing the whole reason why markets are so great. The markets are great because they're creating the information that then allow us to make choices. Uh, but if markets didn't exist, those signals wouldn't exist. And again, I'm going to bring that up when we talk about um, the uh, Austrian view of the business cycle. Then the last one here is process. And I've mentioned this to you a couple of times already. The Austrians lean towards the idea that they don't like that whole general equilibrium thing where, where there's no concept of the passage of time. All right? That your modeling technique, and they, they, they don't like using uh, mathematical models. They do, uh, but they, they kind of, they're careful because they believe that homo sapiens have free will. 
And so we, we sort of um, reduce things to equations. We have eliminated this essential individual element from capitalism. We're not really understanding capitalism when we do that. So, uh, but you still model things. And, and when you do so, you want to model things through time. You want to model development because that's what capitalism is all about, all right, is the dynamic a aspect of it, the creative destruction, uh, the entrepreneurs coming up with new solutions, uh, consumers changing their tastes, and so on. So the whole idea that the economy comes to these stable resting points is completely missing the true nature of capitalism. Capitalism is about process and it's dynamic. Now, do Austrians use graphs? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, they're, they're, they're useful in certain contexts, uh, but they're much more careful about it. When they're going to think through an issue like, for example, business cycle, they're not going to draw a graph for it, right? uh, the, 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 um, at least not for the uh, basic concept of it. Um, so I think that's it for the intro. Uh, let me see. I, I, I want to do the business cycle one a, as a completely separate one. Uh, so this may be a rather short one. Uh, I'll just see if there's any other things I want. I didn't realize it was going to be done so fast on this one. Yep. Already mentioned that. Mm-hmm. I already said that. This is, all, this is all from the book. I'm just looking at my summary of the, uh, of the book. Uh, I will say this. Um, they're, a big part of their argument about why government planning can't work is the government cannot know what you want. That is only inside of you, all right? That is only inside of the individual. So how can the government know how many laptops to make? How can the government know uh, how many... Good Lord. Reign of Cthulhu, oh, sorry, Reign of Cthulhu pandemic games to make. All right, they can't because that's only inside of you. So uh, when you desire these things, you go out and buy them, and you create profits for an entrepreneur, and that becomes a signal to the entrepreneur to make more copies of Reign of Cthulhu pandemic. All right, and let's see here. Yeah, so I said that. One more thing I'd like to mention here before I do the business cycle about the Austrian stuff is that. All these, all these schools of thought outside of neoclassicism, they don't agree with each other, but they generally avoid attacking each other because they figure, hey, man, we're all in trouble as it is. We're all under siege from the main school of thought. Why would we add to that by picking on each other? For example, the next school of thought we're going to do, the post-Keynesian, uh, most certainly does not agree with Marxism in many, many points. Right? Uh, but you don't see a lot of, I actually have seen, a Marxist critique of post-Keynesian economics, uh, but it's very rare. And it was at a conference. It wasn't like out in the open. So it's, it's not a big theme in the literature for Marxists to critique post-Keynesians and vice versa because we don't want to mess with each other when we know we're already getting beat up all right? uh, and um, uh, by the, the mainstream school of thought. Um, that courtesy is often not extended to the Austrians. And for a couple of reasons, it, it, it outlines this at the end of the chapter. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the Austrians tend to be much more pro-market than all of the other uh, remaining you know, non-mainstream schools of thought. Obviously, the Marxists are not. Um, the the, the post-Keynesians are kind of neutral on the whole thing. They're like, well, the market's a tool, as are the Aust uh, institutionalists. The market's a tool. I mean, how could you? It'd be like saying, are you pro hammers to a car to a carpenter? Well, yeah, when I need to drive a nail on a piece of wood, but when I need to make a big piece of wood into a small piece of wood, I use a saw. All right, so they don't really. The, the, the whole idea of being pro a tool doesn't make sense to the post Keynesian institutionalists. Um, and, and then. As you'll see with the ecological and the, and the feminist economics, there's, there's some sense that the market system has caused some real problems. All right. so, so first of all, uh, they tend to lie on the outside of um, the policy recommendations of the, of the remaining schools of thought, but that really uh, by itself isn't necessarily a, a, a huge deal because there's variation within them. But also, Austrians can get away with publishing neoclassical stuff. Uh, if they are willing to kind of you know, keep their mouths shut about certain things, and so they're like, hey, and you're sleeping with the enemy. Uh, you're, you've got it uh, in uh, and in with them, and we don't trust you. So it's very interesting. I, I haven't told you this. I used to be the, um, what do you call it, director 
of the International Confederation of Associations for Pluralism in Economics. I actually think the button's laying over here. Hang on, I just saw it the other day. I don't know. I was cleaning up in here, so I may have tossed it somewhere. No, 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 here it is, here it is. I got it, I got it, okay. Okay, so I took over this organization. I don't remember what year it was. I had to look at my um, CV. But I took over this organization when it was called ICARE, the International Confederation of Associations for the Reform of Economics. Okay, I'm going to let y'all in on a secret. I was embarrassed to say I was the head of I Care. <laughs> so I thought, can we change the name? Uh, and I thought I Cape, the International Confederation of Associations for Pluralism in Economics. I was like, reform of economics, this is my argument to the board, reform of economics, we don't need to reform it, we think we're doing just fine. All right, you know, now you may talk about the broader economics, but we're doing just fine here in post-Keynesian economics and Marxist economics and Austrian economics, and they were all members um, of this organization. Uh, and but besides, we're, we're after pluralism. What we want is the ability for schools of thought to talk to each other and in a respectful manner, all right? So anyway, I always remember at the board meetings, one guy in particular, was like, you know, well, I don't want to include the Austrians. I said, well, we can't do that. I mean, if we're truly for pluralism, we can't say, uh, except that guy. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I always was arguing for either we do this right or we don't do it at all. In fact, we should include the neoclassicals if they're interested in joining. They're not, but, um, uh, you know, they should be welcome as well because the point here is different schools of thought. So anyway, there's this underlying tension between the Austrians and the other non-mainstream schools of thought. And I have to tell you, that was one of the things that really drove me to drive the book, to, to, uh, drove me to write the book, uh, was that the book I was using was A, 20 years old, and B, the Austrian chapter was clearly written by a non-Austrian who was just attacking it. And then they think this stupid thing, that stupid thing. Save that for the pulpit, mister. We're here to educate. Uh, and so that's why I spent three years of my life writing a book that I really didn't want to write, but I wrote it anyway. Um, and that's it. So let's stop here, and then the next one will be on the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Really interesting stuff. I actually believe I shall eat lunch now. Pardon me.